epidemic, with more than two-thirds of the world's population of persons infected with HIV living there. In Sub-Saharan Africa, women and girls are disproportionately affected, representing 61% of people living with HIV in the region. Women in Sub-Saharan Africa are 1.3 times more likely to be infected with HIV than men. This risk is greatest for young women, ages 15 to 24, who are three to four times more likely to be infected with HIV than young men of the same age. The literature relative to the experiences of the international community of women living with HIV has increased significantly over the last decade. However, we see that the voices of the women of Sub-Saharan Africa um, who are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic continue <coughs> to be cloaked in silence. For the past 13 years, as you've heard, Fatima gave a wonderful introduction, <laughs> I've been engaged in research in both Ghana and South Africa. And I, was, I, I really hoped that I would be able to gain some meaningful insight into the life <coughs> worlds of women who are living with HIV and AIDS. And I've learned so much um, from the many women who have so graciously shared their lives with me over the years. <coughs> Lessons from, that I've learned from my African sisters suggest that to live with HIV AIDS is to live with loss. It is to live with secrecy, to live with fear, to live in isolation, to live with worry, to live with symptoms, pain, and disability. To live with HIV is to live with loss. To live with HIV is to live with secrecy and fear, isolation, worry. To live with HIV is to live with loss. But before there was HIV, there was loss. To live with HIV is to live with more loss. To suffer the loss of job and loss of income. To live with HIV is to live with the loss of peers and significance. To live with HIV is to live with a progressive loss of health. To live with HIV is to live with loss of independence and the capacity to perform roles. To live with HIV is to live with a loss of dreams. To live with HIV is to live with a loss of one's former self. To live with HIV is to live with a secret. To live with HIV is to live in secrecy. To live with HIV is to live in isolation. To live with HIV is to live in fear of exposure, fear of stigma, fear of scorn. To live with HIV is to live with worry. To live with HIV is to live with worry concerning the children one will leave behind and the children one will never bear. To live with HIV is to live with worry concerning the inability to care for oneself and for one's children. To live with HIV is to live with worry concerning one's death. To live, with to live with HIV is to live with anxiety. To live with HIV is to live with sadness, sorrow, and grief. To live with HIV is to depend upon the kindness of family, to purchase symptom-relieving medications. <coughs> to live with HIV is to help seek, to, to visit the clinics, the shrines, the churches. To live with HIV is to live with disability. Over the years, I've struggled to make some sense of all that I've learned from women about how their lives have been impacted by HIV AIDS. While these women's experiences of living with HIV AIDS speak to their powerful impact, um, or the powerful impact that the pandemic is having on their, their lives at the micro level, their experiences also underscore the notion that broad macro level issues are fueling the epidemic. The phenomenon of HIV AIDS is a social justice issue. At its core are the intersecting issues of classism, sexism, and racism, reflecting differences in the ways in which women are valued or devalued. Clearly, the epidemic's escalating impact on women of the African continent and throughout the world is occurring within the context of profound inequalities in terms of gender, class, and race. Um, in its 
2004 update, um, UNA stated this, and I thought it was an interesting quote. They said, many HIV strategies assume an idealized world in which everyone is equal and free to make empowered choices and can opt to abstain from sex. They can stay faithful to one's partner and use condoms consistently. In reality, women and girls face a range of HIV-related risk factors and vulnerabilities that men and boys do not, many of which are embedded in the social re relations and economic realities of their society. These factors are not easily dislodged or altered, but until they are, efforts to contain and reverse the HIV-AIDS epidemic are, un are unlikely to achieve any sustained success. UNA suggests that gender oppression is at the very heart of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Certainly we must focus on prevention interventions which target individual behavior change, but it is clear that in order for our efforts to truly make a difference, that we must address the interplay between gender and socioeconomic inequality and vulnerability to HIV. They are inextricably linked. Consider, for example, a Ghanaian woman who's faced with the option of sharing her body with a man who offers to pay her school fees, children, her children's school fees, a man whom she knows to be married and sexually active with other women. Why should any woman have to make a choice in such a situation? How realistic would it be for her to negotiate safer sex? The contributions that such broad macro level issues make to HIV positive outcomes among African women and our sisters worldwide uh, are clear. At the core of the pandemic are issues such as unequal access to education, limited access to wealth accumulation. Uh, all of these issues contribute to women's uh, vulnerability and their diminished capacity to control what does and not does not happen to their bodies. The formal report emerging from the International Conference in Barcelona of July 2002 succinctly frames HIV as a human rights issue, stating that around the world, those people most affected by HIV AIDS are people and communities who have unequal access to fundamental social and economic rights. The denial of basic rights limits people's options to defend their autonomy, develop viable livelihoods, and protect themselves, leaving them more vulnerable to HIV infection and the impact of the epidemic on their lives. It is clear that strategies are needed to address the structural dynamics of the HIV AIDS epidemic, particularly the wide-ranging gender inequalities that are fueling the epidemic. Given the sheer magnitude of the pandemic, and the devastating effects it is having not only on African women and our sisters throughout the globe, our awareness of the contributions that a broad range of growth inequities are making towards the continued worsening of the problem bears the question, how do we move forward? How should we proceed? I believe that we must not only frame women and HIV AIDS as an issue of social justice and human rights, but we must also assume an activist stance. <coughs> Uh, and join forces with the global interdisciplinary cadre of persons that are committed to diminishing the impact of HIV AIDS on the world's women by promoting their social and economic empowerment. There are a number of avenues that we might take toward expanding our involvement in addressing the impact of HIV AIDS on women across the globe. And I think that we all understand that there's power in numbers. There's power when we come together. Um, getting connected with organizations such as Women of Color United uh, and the Global Coalition uh, on Women and AIDS would be meaningful steps in becoming actively engaged in women-focused HIV-AIDS related advocacy. And we're really blessed to have Jackie with us uh, today, Jackie Patterson. In addition to being at the forefront of global <coughs> HIV-AIDS activism, Jackie is the founding director of Women of Color United, and we'll hear a lot about that. But when Women of Color United brings together constituencies of over 50,000 women 
uh, nationwide and really worldwide toward the struggle for social justice on behalf of women of color impacted by the intersectionalities of gender, HIV, AIDS, and violence. And so we'll hear from Jackie later on. Uh, another opportunity for collaborative work in women-focused HIV-AIDS advocacy is through the global